Okay, this is going to be one of the hardest videos that I ever try to do because I am going to attempt to say nice things about Everclear. And that's going to be really hard for me because I really hated this band at the time. They were everything that I disliked about radio, about music, about what the direction of rock music had taken at the time. So the interesting thing about 90s alternative rock is nobody held the crown for very long. And there was this dead spot in the 90s from between about 1994 to the end of about 1999 that was just like the Hunger Games of alternative rock music. People just kept going down in flames over and over again. First, it looks like Nirvana is going to be the biggest band for the rest of the decade. Nope, shotgun, needle. And it looks like it's going to be Pearl Jam. No, Eddie doesn't like being famous. Then maybe Soundgarden? No, they broke up. For one hot minute, it looks like Smashing Pumpkins are going to pull it off. You know, you should know better than to think anything with Billy Corgan is going to do anything other than implode. But during that sort of dead, uncertain spot where nobody knew what was going to happen next or who was going to blow up next, that's where Everclear sort of stepped in and made a case for themselves, and it looked like they might have a fighting chance at becoming one of the biggest bands in the world. And I think that was what I really disliked about them more than anything. They seemed to pose this kind of threat. At the time, I was really opposed to it. I found them incredibly bland, lyrically, melodically, and rhythmically. None of their songs really did anything for me. But it, of course it didn't last. It did achieve a lot of success, but it ended up being kind of glossed over by the direction that music history had taken. So Everclear were a band from Portland, Oregon, who formed in 1991. They made the interesting choice to name themselves after what is typically thought of as one of the strongest brands of liquor available. And that's interesting because the lead singer is very upfront about his struggles with addiction and alcoholism and with his uh, psychological problems that he's experienced throughout his life, some of which was fought with addiction. And the original lineup consisted of lead singer and guitarist Art Alexicus, bassist Craig Montoya, and drummer Scott Cuthbert. Their first album was called World of Noise, and it was released in 1993 on this tiny indie label called Tim Kerr Records. I listened to World of Noise for the first time for this video, and I did find myself enjoying it probably more than any of their radio stuff. That's not the most original stuff in the world, like if you've already heard Pixies, Wipers, bands like Husker Du, Dinosaur Jr., especially Nirvana, then you've pretty much got it covered. You don't really need to hear this unless you're already a fan of theirs. But if you are a fan, you'll probably get a lot more out of it than I did. So you can hear in Art Alexis's vocals, he has this, this kind of like southern sort of twang to it, like Kurt Cobain had, which he drops entirely for his the next albums that he does. He never really sounds like this again. But you can hear how badly they want to be Nirvana already, and this, this song is called Nervous and Weird. There are some songs in here that are a little more up-tempo, that have a little more energy than the stuff that Everclear became famous for, but... You know, still very derivative to me. Still not much about it that makes it stand out. You know, he's still kind of singing with that pseudo Cobain voice throughout all of it. You know, I think there's a song in here that says something like, I'm not gonna break, no way, I'm not gonna break, just like uh, Kurt sings in Lithium, I'm not gonna crack, I love you, I'm not gonna crack. So it's very obvious what they were going for on this album. It worked out for them, apparently. They were able to get themselves a major label record deal after this. And really, this band was very hard for me to hate, and I think that made me hate them more. This is a combination of, like, earnestness and mediocrity that made me feel guilty, actually, for disliking them. Some bands are guilty pleasures, you know, you feel bad for liking them. This band, for me, was a guilty displeasure. You know, I felt like I wanted to like them, but they just weren't good enough. So their second album was called Sparkle and Fade. This album was released in 1995, and it was their first album for Capitol Records. They're already sounding a lot more mainstream on this album, I think. This is the opening track from it called The Lecture Made Me Blind. The song's called Heroin Girl. This band's always been very upfront about their drug issues. But they come at it from a perspective, I think, of having overcome those issues. And I guess that made them sound a little preachy to me, a little didactic. I kind of felt like I was being lectured by them at times. This is the song, You Make Me Feel Like a Whore. This was the first song that I remember seeing in a music video of them. This didn't really do anything for them. I don't see this standing out very much in 1995, 96, whenever it was released. I guess he is kind of still singing with that little drawl, but... Not as pronounced, not as much as on the first album. It's just something about the way this music is put together, these chords and this tune. It's, it all just adds up to nothing for me. I don't really feel anything listening to this. 
Yeah, this one you probably know. I think this is where they found their signature sound that was going to launch them into the mainstream. This is Santa Monica, by the way. This was their biggest hit to date at the time they did this album. I never liked it. It always sounded like a, gee, like a less catchy version of Weezer to me or something. You know, it's something about this rhythm and this, I don't know, it's just so dull to me. It's, it's just kind of a miserable slog to listen to. And I feel bad about it because I can tell it's coming from a real genuine place. I just don't feel the passion that's supposed to be there, I guess. But this is basically a breakup song. This one doesn't go so deep into the issues and psychological problems and the addictions that they sing about in other songs. I mean, that melody's got maybe two notes in it total, and it just, you know, it's all mid-range. There's no low notes, there's no high notes, it's all in between. To me, when I hear it, it's just the most drab, gray, colorless music imaginable. Yeah, that's why I didn't enjoy it at the time, and I, I honestly, I still don't. So the last album Everclear made in the 90s was their biggest selling album up to that date. It's called So Much For The Afterglow. It had a lot of big hits on it, a lot of radio airplay, and this was the point, I think 1997 was when this album was released, and this is the point where they, I think they were threatening to become the next big thing. They sort of got to the precipice of that, never quite made the transition all the way over. Whew, that was close. For a minute there, it really looked like they were gonna become the biggest band in the world. They were very successful. They still got to be very popular, but yeah, probably not as popular as it seemed like they were going to be at the time. And this is the first single from that album. It's called Everything to Everyone. This song does have a pretty cool video to it. I'll give it that. It's just this endless rotating camera thing that keeps changing and moving. Oh, do those chords sound familiar? Well, let me back them up for you. I'll just let that one speak for itself. And this to me is just another one of their songs. It's not a whole lot of variation to it. There's not a whole lot of tune to it. There's not really any real hooks. I guess that guitar tone is a little bit different. It's a little more chorusy than distorted. Yeah, it still doesn't really do anything for me. I'm sorry. It's kind of a smug song too. Oh, but this is the one I really hated. I just couldn't imagine anything lamer than this coming out that year, 1997. This is I Will Buy You A New Life. And I don't really get the financial arrangement of this song either, so apparently he owes this person money, but this person is so short on money that he has to buy them everything. How did he end up in this person's debt? Is he this person's fault why they're broke? Is like that the whole reason why he's taking it on himself now? This is a guilt song? All I know is that this song made my teenagers worse. Every time I heard it, I just got so bummed out. I feel so bad about it. It's got such good intentions, but it just doesn't get the job done musically. And I guess listening to their songs on a world like this, I can sort of see the appeal of them. They've got sort of this everyman appeal to them. I guess maybe that's the same reason why people like Springsteen or whatever. You no, know, people who just sound like regular average dudes walking up off the street and just cranking out a couple of tunes. I've never gone in for the real like blue collar working class sort of style of rock. You know, I guess a lot of the stuff I listen to is more suburban. Basically, I want music to come from either people who are super rich or super poor. I'm not really interested in anything in between. Here's where he talks about the shopping list of things he's gonna buy. Oh really? Tell me more about this new car. What other adjectives can you think of to describe it? Well, it's perfect, it's shiny, it's 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 new. Oh, the new car is new? Wow. I I wouldn't have thought to describe it that way. This song is called Father of Mine. Father of mine. Tell me where There's that guitar rhythm again. There's that voice. I don't know what it is. Why do I cringe so hard when I hear this stuff? You know, I guess maybe lyrically it's a little too straightforward for me and melodically there's not enough variation to it. There's so few notes and there's so little variation in the singing, in the tones, in the style of it that it just, it all falls flat for me. I feel like it doesn't accomplish the effect that it's going for. I feel like I'm supposed to be relating to this like pretty hard, you know? I'm supposed to be saying, yeah, I feel this pain. I, I understand it. I understand where these guys are coming from. I relate to it. But it never comes across. You know, lyrically, I, I might be a little bit of a snob. I like, I like things to be a little less spelled out for me. I don't like people to just 
rip pages out of their diary and say, well, this is what happened to me. This is how it made me feel. I like the approaches that are a little more suggestive. I like people to express things in a little more of a roundabout way to me. And this is powerful material, but it's all just kind of rendered meaningless to me. I guess the structure of it kind of turns me off too. There's no real transition between like the verses and the chorus parts. And I don't think those lyrics would fly today either. Talking about being a, a white boy growing up in a black neighborhood, I think people would kind of look at you sideways for saying something like that. Like, oh no, the poor little white boy, I'm so, I'm, I'm so sorry. Even at the time, I have to imagine that there were people kind of looking at that and saying like, okay, you know, that's a little questionable. Uh, okay, we'll go along with the rest. This boy is obviously very sad. So we'll just go along with it. Just to be fair, I'm gonna play this song that I remembered liking at the time. This is called Amphetamine. This is more of their punkier sound. It sounds a little more polished on this than on the first album. I guess it just rocked hard enough for me when I was younger. Honestly, I think I just liked that it didn't sound like their other songs. That was all it took for them to impress me at the time. Otter Lexicus had a very sad life. His mother threw herself off of a bridge when he was young and he didn't know that she was his mother at the time. He thought she was her aunt. He wrote this song about it called Why I Don't Believe in God. This is a little more of a folkier, acoustic type of track. You know, I'm gonna let him have this one. Obviously that was very difficult to go through. And, you know, who am I to say really what is the right way to express feeling or emotion in a song. All I have are my personal opinions and biases, and I like to think that the music that I listen to sort of captures or articulates or evokes the same kinds of sentiments or the same kind of emotions in a superior way, but that's all subjective. So, you know, if you're a fan of this band, I can't, I can't really raise too much objection to it because they are the type of band that seem like if you hear them when you're the right age, if you're at the right stage in your life, they are going to be important to you. But for the rest of us, yeah, we're, we're out. It's just not going to happen. I'm not going to suddenly rediscover Everclear and recognize the brilliance within them. I think I probably bring my own baggage to it from when I was younger, and it's not something that I can get past, unfortunately. But I'm sure it happens to everyone as we grow older, we gradually close ourselves off to these kinds of possibilities. And to their credit, you know, once the 90s were over, they didn't get totally washed up right away. You know, it took a little while. They had a couple more successful albums at the beginning of the 2000s. So they're one of the very, very few 90s bands that found success in this period and still managed to remain successful going into the following decade. So good on them for that. I still don't care for their music, but, you know, I'm not going to take an accomplishment like that away from them, given that a lot of better groups and a lot of bands that I like more than that were not able to make the same transition that they did. So until next time, I am the Jake Wayo. This was Bad 90s Music, and I'll see you sometime in the future.